Fragen haben vielleicht? Ja, Ton geht. Äh, liebe Anwesende, ich... Dear participants, I'd just like uh, to welcome you to uh, the Open Forum this year. I have uh, been asked as a member of uh, the WEF uh, Foundation to extend a warm welcome to you and perhaps to give you an overview of uh, the program we're going uh, to be uh, dealing with. You've probably seen uh, that uh, we've got a very rich program and we're going uh, to talk about how to instill life into European democracy, such as uh, increasing security, environmental and climate issues. And you've also seen that uh, the program for this week also uh, plans to show you two films, one from the Sundance uh, uh, film from Aleppo and uh, the latest film from Al Gore, which is called An Uncomfortable Truth. You've probably seen that uh, there are a lot of people, very important people, will be uh, participating in the Open Forum. You've got uh, the uh, Nobel Prize Wise uh, winner Malala and Alain Berset, the uh, federal president, not at uh, not least. I think that this is a very special moment for me uh, here at the Open Forum. As uh, pro president of uh, the member of uh, the foundation of the World Economic Forum, and as somebody who in earlier roles uh, has been involved with the WEF uh, in different roles, I just know that there is a difficult uh, relationship between globalization and those who criticize globalization. The World Economic Forum is in a process of transformation, just as the critis, critics of globalization are involved in a process of transformation. And I think that the Open Forum is a wonderful opportunity for us to look at that uh, transformation process, to look at uh, the uh, things that are happening and to analyze them in more detail, and also to be able to look at uh, the various opinions uh, which often separate us and uh, which uh, sometimes uh, conceal the underlying facts. I think that uh, there is, uh, of course, every right for people to criticize globalization. We have to hear what they're saying. The Open Forum is a very important uh, part of this whole discussion process, and it plays a non-negligible role. What we're trying to do here is to have good discussions and to have in-depth uh, knowledge generated as a result of the various arguments that are exchanged. Now, as is so often the case when you work uh, for the uh, humanitarian organizations such as the International Red uh, Cross, we are often at the crossroads between controversial positions. And I think it is important uh, that we address all these issues, and I'm happy to be part of the panel. Now, the Open Forum today reminds me of uh, what uh, happened 18 years ago. I was part of a working group uh, set up by the federal government it was something that actually led uh, to the Open Forum. It was uh, precisely at a time when there was a lot of criticism being voiced with regard uh, to globalization. So it is a great moment for me to be able to welcome you here at the Open Forum, and I hope that you will have a very interesting week and that you will have some in-depth discussions on these uh, so important issues. To begin with, let me introduce the moderator. I'll switch to English so that the moderator can understand me. Sie haben gesehen, uh, Afsin Yudakul ist uh, Moderatoring Anchor der türkischen. She is a moderator of uh, the news anchor of Habertürk News in Turkey. She has published a lot on the foreign relations of uh, Turkey and uh, she often organizes discussions on these issues. Yurda Kul and she will introduce all the other members of the panel. So if choreography works right, uh, there should be Afsin now coming to the stage and me sitting down here and then the others coming to the stage.
our world seems fractured. It's hard to see coherence. In theory, we may think globally and feel as one. But in reality, identity politics and tribalism are on the rise. There's nothing wrong with our devices, but the way we are using them is hurting empathy and intimacy. Do I really want to sit here behind a computer screen making friends, or do I want to make some real friends? And appreciate what makes them different from ourselves? Unconscious bias comes from upbringing and experience, but with a bit of conscious effort, we can manually override our unconscious bias settings. Discrimination comes in many forms. Being little in a big-sized world. Basketball player Germani Swanson may be short in stature, but is big in dribbling and scoring for the Harlem Globetrotters. The biggest Christian community in the Middle East can lawfully and freely express its religion. Copts carry Egyptian passports. Yet in rural areas, emotional and religion-based tribal traps trigger deadly attacks on Copts. Ethnic minorities face systematic discrimination from governments. After violence between Rakhine Buddhists and Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, the stateless Rohingya are being driven out of the country. How can we resolve identity-based conflicts? We believe all human beings are by nature free and equal. Peace! I think a completely inclusive society would be a place where everybody has equal access and opportunity for everything. I would describe it as a party or a dance uh, where Everybody gets invited and everybody gets asked to dance. Inclusion is about engaging everyone. It's about all of us. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the Open Forum. Um, in, in Davos. It's a great pleasure to be here and um, I have to admit I love the format as well because it lets us um, communicate with the Davos community as well, not only uh, those guests at the conference but also with you. Um, many thanks again, uh, once again to Peter for the introductions. Um, I would like to first introduce you my speakers and tell you briefly why we're here today. Um, Ms. Sinead Burke is founder of Mini Melange, and she's from Ireland, an activist and writer. Um, Mrs. Weiwei Nu is founder and director of Women Peace Network from Myanmar. And Dr. Daniel Shapiro is founder and director of Harvard International Negotiation Program. And Dr. Peter Maurer is the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. We're all here because we are going to talk about how to unite at a moment in time when we read in the news about too much division, about humanitarian crises and political unrest <laughs> unfolding in different corners of the world. And we all feel like we need to do something about it. We don't like seeing the world the way it is with theory, political rhetoric, and humanitarian crises and refugees fleeing their homes. We don't like to know that we live in a world where there is division and discrimination, but at the same time, maybe it's time now to think creatively and constructively about what we can all do to fix that too, to build bridges between communities and countries and individuals. So that's what brings us here today. And I'm joined by amazing panelists today. They have stories to share. They'll tell you about what inspires them. And they're also going to tell you about what solutions we can come up with together as the global community. And um, I also want to tell you a bit about the format of the debate as well. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to um, ask our panelists, you will be allowed to do so, and we will have time for it towards the end of this session. We have about 20 minutes for your questions. And uh, for, 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 the, for the beginning, for the first section of the debate, 
for the panel. Um, we're going to hear from our panelists and they will share their perspectives with you. So having said that and taking care of uh, quick notes for housekeeping, I would like to first turn to Sinead Berkey because she has, I'm sure you've seen her TED Talk and her video, and if not, you've read her interviews before. She is a very strong voice, and I would like to hear from her. What inspires her to do the work that she's doing, and what solutions do you have in mind in terms of bridging those gaps, and what challenges have you faced? So just share with us your story tonight. Good morning. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. My name is Sinead Burke. I am an academic writer and advocate from Dublin, Ireland. And as regards to where my passion or interest for this field came about, it was probably the moment I was born, if not the moment that I could speak. And if I could bring you back to the 19th of September, 1994, that was my first day of elementary school. You're all very quickly trying to guess my age. I'm 27. <laughs> and I walked into that room to 30 strangers, children, and introduced myself by saying, hi, my name is Sinead. I have a chondroplasia. That's A-C-H-O-N-D-R-O-P-L-A-S-I-A. -A. I was a very advanced four-year-old. And said that I'm going to be an elementary school teacher. For me, the notion of education is what combats so many of the challenges. It's what breaks down cycles of poverty, of oppression. But despite that, I went through a school system and an education system where nobody at the top of the room looked like me. I never had a teacher that was physically disabled. And we didn't have a culture of that in Ireland or in other parts of the world. And that passion to do something different came about and was flourished in my family. I'm very fortunate to have been born into a family who nourished that appetite for mine. And as I got older, I realized that actually so much of my challenges were not caused based on my genetic mutation and achondroplasia and the mutation of my FGF43 gene, but it was actually caused by the lack of constructive and creative thinking from those with power in this world. So for example, my greatest difficulty is that I live in a world built for you. And as difficult as it is getting around and mobilizing Davos at your size, Take five seconds to imagine what it's like being three foot five when there has been three foot, three meters of snow in the past couple of days. I am one meter. And for me, as regards to solutions, it's about breaking down those barriers of power and understanding that those in privileged positions need those with lived experience collaborate together and create something innovative and new that is not just something that we do for legislative reasons, but brings about creative opportunities and profitability. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sinead. We'll, we'll definitely come back to your story and we want to hear from you how we can actually do this together because you talk about the importance of constructive and creative thinking mm -hmm. in terms of how to overcome these barriers and we'll get back to you about that. Um, so Sinead has done a lot to challenge the status quo in her own society and we're not alone in terms of our panelists who have done the same in their own countries and their societies. And I want to turn to Wei Wei Nu um, at this point to hear your own story. You have, you've gone through a lot to push for democracy and equality in your own society. And I know that you have a very powerful story to share with us as well. And as a journalist, I have to say, I really do believe in the power of stories to unite people. And I think we can very much relate to the other human being by hearing their own stories, even if we know nothing about the context or the culture. Um, or their background. So that's why I wanted to start with stories and Sinead gave us a great start and I think Wei Wei Nu is definitely uh, going to give us really good thoughts that we can ponder for days to come. Thank you, um, Afsin. Um, thank you for great introductions. And I'm so glad to be here and, and so privileged to share my stories story. Um, so I come from, as uh, you may aware, I come from Burma, Myanmar, and I b belong to a community called Rohingya, which is not recognized by the state, but I do believe I belong to the state. And I was belong to the state until recently. And I found my identity was, in a way, systematically excluded 
it starts from like social cultural rights, and then it's and then it's um, go beyond that, and it's like and it's go to the political rights and economic rights and even the existence. So when I was young, I started to feel that my community was not same as other community. Although I grown up in the capital city, I did not face much of discrimination, but I was hearing from my family members in Rakhine State that they were not able to go outside of their village and they need to get per, uh, permission to go out of the village. And they need to get permission to, to, uh, to get married. They need to get permission to go to the school. And all of their all aspects of their livelihood started um, her, uh, face restrictions, and I felt, and I didn't know what was that. And when I was 18, I was taken away from my home with my father and the whole family members, and I was put in jail for seven years, and I was released in 2012. And although you know it was really hard being inside the prison, uh, one of my big hope was. I will try to be strong, and I will try to be um, an educated person so that I can help prevent this kind of uh, injustice to other people. And when I came out, I went to the law school again, and at the end of the law school, I was graduated, basically, I was in the podium, and I was given a certificate, and I say thank you to the dean on the podium, on the, on the, on the stage. And I took a few steps and realized it was not a degree. It just says, uh, says, go and inquire at the office. And I went to the office and inquired, what happened? Why it's not degree certificate? And he said, because you have to change your identity card. And I asked the dean, what about you then? When you get degree certificate, you have the same card as me, right? And she said, yes. What about other professors? They also have the same card as me. Basically, it was I was holding the old types of identity card in the country all because the authority didn't issue me uh, the new, new identity citizenship card, basically. So, but then, this old type of card was the card that all individuals in the country, including the leaders of the country, and President Teng Seng to Do Aung San Suu Kyi was holding until 2015, and they got to, be, to do everything. But for certain populations like me and some other minorities, uh, Muslims, Christians, and Hindus, who are not um, uh, by the system given those kind of identity card, like new form of identity card, started to face exclusions in all uh, aspects of their life, including uh, the education. Finally, because I was outspoken and I talked to different people, including special uh, human rights special reporter on Myanmar, Ms. Yang Hili, and finally the minister has changed uh, the policy. And I came to know at the end of the day, I mean, when I went back and get my degree certificate, it was 300 other students only in my university. So I was so shocked. Imagine how many student will be in the whole entire country. And I believe the system is still continuing in other part of the country. And, and this is how I feel exclude, excluded. And I was so upset and angry, and I was like, I, I, I don't know how to deal with that. Um, because, you know, I thought this, is a, this certificate is very important for me to be a lawyer or to, be, to get a job, right? And it, it is one example that we face exclusions in my own country. And, and as a community like Rohingya and as other minority groups, they, they face tens of exclusions. And I realized that all these exclusions has created inequality among the society and among the people in the country. And it's led to the discriminations and even the conflict and even the, you know, finally create a uh, largest world humanitarian crisis, and which is kind of, you know, the 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 uh, office of the high UN office of the high commissioner uh, report has described its amount to the crimes against humanity, and and it's somehow involving elements of genocide. And this is where we face, uh, you know, like a small step of exclusions to minority groups or to certain population to 
larger um, uh, impact to the uh, to the world. I mean, to to the country and to the world. It can lead to the. It is it is in fact in fact becoming a global uh, uh, a threat to the global peace as well. And and it's I I believe it is the same form of. Um, exclusions in all other countries, which has been creating or letting different form of conflict and mm -hmm. and, and wars in the world. Thank you, Wei Wei That was very powerful, um, and especially your comments about exclusion and exclusion and more mm -hmm. of that creating lack of equality, and then basically we have these problems of this unity in societies. So we'll get back to that as well. Um, now, we, we've heard from two of our speakers who have different but powerful stories. They have experienced it firsthand in flesh and blood, and then they were inspired to just go out and change it to the best of their ability. They pushed for change. Be that Myanmar or Ireland, these are stories of struggle. However, these countries are not alone. We, there are other parts of the world where we see similar stories, challenges, and inspiring individuals who go out and push for change. To get that global perspective, I would like to turn to Peter Maurer. And, and because ICRC works as a broker um, of constructive dialogue in conflict zones, and your organization works as um, uh, the function of your organization is quite important because you're you're experiencing it firsthand, the division and the challenges, and, and you're on the front lines. So what is your observation, keeping in mind all the places in the world where ICRC functions, um, in terms of the common things that drive, uh, in terms of drivers of conflict and disunity, what are the common things? What do you see in common, regardless of what part of the world we're talking about? Thanks a lot, uh, Afsin. Yes, uh, when I listen to uh, the two previous speakers and when I look at the 25 large front lines and fracture lines in which most of our resources and energies are spent at the present moment, there's no surprise that what you just heard resonates and can almost be built into a model because it's always the same. I would say it starts with single identity politics. Politicians trying to reduce groups of people to single identity. These, and then comes the lack of empathy and exclusion, which is basically the two kinds of the same medal. But the trigger is always single identity politics. So Matthias Sen already made this wonderful book on identity and violence and reducing a person to a single identity or reducing your space, your policy space in a country to a single identity is basically the biggest driver of violence because the violence is only the consequence of exclusion, discrimination, injustice. And we go where we are. But at the end of the day, this is the red threat. This is at the core of everything. Just a week ago, exactly, I was visiting Central African Republic. And I went back to the same place I have been four years ago, in the north of Central African Republic, to a place called Kagabandoro. Four years ago, this was a city in the north of Central African Republic in which Christians and Muslims were working together and living together. But identity politics drove those communities aside and afar. Today, you come to, central, to Kagabandoro and the center is destroyed by single identity violence And they have their own markets, and they don't visit the respective other markets. And in a no man's land between, there is a hospital run by ICRC and the UN peacekeeping operations. 
this is a devastating story and is a devastating picture of what happens when you let single identity policy and violence drive political agendas. And if we can't accept, and this is a place also to discuss globalization and identity here in Davos, if we can't accept that globalization leads to a situation where we have multiple identities, and we are not just the ones or the other, but we are the ones and the others, and it is up to each individual, to each community to define its own identity and not to others to impose a definition of what identity is. If we don't break this cycle, we will just continue the mess in which we are. And it is a mess and a major mess because we run from escalation of violence to other escalations of violence. I think that's maybe the main message. What can you do afterwards? And here we can expand a little bit later, but just a small illusion, uh, allusion to it. I think at the present moment, humanitarian work as we conceive it, as neutral, impartial, and independent work by intermediaries to re-establish trust amongst communities is basically the first core step to turn the tide. Though that's what we are trying to do, at least not shift the discussion to necessarily what is your identity, but shift the discussion what can we do together? And how can we craft a humanitarian program which again makes pe people work together for the common concerns they have? So one of the strategies we are driving in those situations is to find projects and issues and to frame them along which forces communities to meet again right. around the water distribution system, around the health cl uh, clinic, around the basic elementary humanitarianism. But it is of deep importance in peace building because while we are a neutral and impartial actor, at the end of the day we should represent and we want to represent an important building block for building peace. And this goes in having the community accept each other when they meet at the water distribution system. Dr. Maurer, thank you for that. And we will indeed get back to you to talk about how we can come up with solutions. But first, I would like to go to Dr. Shapiro. Um, and we've heard stories and we've heard personal accounts of struggle. Mm -hmm. And um, from Dr. Maurer, we also heard about conflict zones mm -hmm. and a very striking example of communities, people who live perhaps blocks away from each other but not even going to the same supermarket. Yeah. What is wrong with us? I think maybe that's the way to put it. How are, just like Dr. Maurer said, yeah. how are we to break that cycle and how are we to communicate so that we understand each other. And again, like Dr. Mara said, not one or the other, but one and the other. Is it, is it that hard? What is it that is so hard about right. it? And why is it all similar? Like, like he said at the beginning of uh, his, uh, his comments, it's more or less the same thing wherever you go in the world. Why? I, I, first, thank you for this opportunity to be here today and to hear the stories of my fellow panelists. Uh, it's, it's very moving. Um, I think the, the, the question of what's wrong with us also connects very deeply with the question about what's right with us. Uh, every act of violence has been committed in the name of virtue. Every actor who has attempted to do something that many see as atrocious from their perspective. You ask them why, and at the very least, they have some rationalization about why they are doing what they are doing. Uh, I, I, I appreciated the video at the beginning of our session uh, that, that spoke about the challenge of tribalism in our world. I, I, as our world has become more and more globalized in the last 20, 30 years with Google, with economic interconnections as never before and so on, I think that has placed the human being in a very difficult circumstance. And it is about identity, I think. How do we define who we are 
in this massive expanse of identity. If we are all interconnected and we're all deeply, you know, we're swimming in the single ocean uh, together, who am I? And I think it's, it's very easy at that point in time to retrench to tribes. Is that, very, is, is that a fundamental thing for humans to feel like they have a certain identity and this is what I belong to? Is that the only way to feel comfortable? I think it's a beautiful thing. Skin? This is where I think it's a problem and, it, and it's, it's an opportunity. It's a beautiful yeah. part of the human uh, capacity. What do we want at core? What do we feel most connected to? It is our family. And when I feel afraid... I withdraw, you know, I call my mom, <laughs> uh, and my kids call me. Uh, you know, we withdraw to family when we feel threatened, when our identity feels threatened on some level. You look at the global society we have right now, identities are feeling threatened. And I think that is in part a systemic problem, and so people withdraw. The fact that we're withdrawing to who we see as our close family, I don't see that as the problem. The, the, the problem is how we deal with our differences. Are we going to deal with our differences through active violence and militarism? Are we going to deal with our violences through political activism? Are we going to deal with our, our differences through conflict resolution, through trying to deal with things more effectively? Uh, so, and I think right now, at least in the United States, I can say, there's an air of thinking, pff, conflict resolution, trying to work things out. It, ah, no, you know, that doesn't sound right. Uh, and it's more, well, let's move toward uh, whatever side you're on, you know, uh, political activism, uh, and for some, even violence. But help us understand that. I think that moment is crucial when we think, oh, there's no way we can talk about it. Yeah. You work with individuals and governments, too. Is there anything common in the way they react when you talk about communicating? Why, why do we think it's hard to mm. talk about those differences? Because it seems like we had a family dispute yeah. or intergovernmental issues mm. or conflicts. Do they have something in common? Absolutely. I, I think when my identity feels threatened... I fall prey, we all fall prey at that point in time to a shift in mindset. And, and I call this mindset the tribe's effect. <laughs> and, and, and there are three basic characteristics, as I see it, to this mindset. One, it's adversarial. So the moment you say something that offends me, my religious background, my family, my kids, whatever it is, whoosh, that mindset sets in, one, it's adversarial. As much as we might be good friends now, it's me versus you. Two, this mindset is self-righteous. I know I am right and my perspective is legitimate and you are wrong and your perspective is crazy. <laughs> and, and the third characteristic of this mindset is that it is a closed system. It's insular. It's, it's that you know, now um, very common phrase, it's an echo chamber. Uh, I argue, I defend my perspective and I close my ears to yours. And I think it is that mindset that is a self-preservation mechanism. It is common to all of humanity. And yet it is also a major challenge in terms of communicating effectively with the other. It, we, we auto, you know, it happens to all of us. Automatically, the blinders go up and I can no longer hear your perspective. As much as I think that I'm a good and compassionate person, I just can't hear you. I want to go back to Sinead because uh, both our speakers mentioned uh, the role of the Internet helping or hurting. Let, let, let's, let's look at that a little bit. We have a hashtag for this forum. Um, we're, we're snapping pictures, posting them on Instagram and Twitter. You're probably quoting our panelists and tweeting about them. That's great. We feel connected. But at the same time, I want to, I want to think about, take a moment and think about this for a bit. What do you think about this? echo chamber effect, the algorithms. We follow people who think like us. Are we exposed to how other people are thinking about the world that we live in? What is your take, Sinead? Because I know that you really try to get this message across and you believe in the power of online communication too. So I'm especially curious what you think about this. For me, the role of the internet and social media platforms in particular have been personally and professionally transformative. As an educator, I'm entirely conscious of the negative impacts of the internet, particularly for the next generation and those currently trying to find out and to scaffold what their identity is among a narrative that tells them they are not thin enough, they are not beautiful enough, or whatever might be playing out online. 
However, for me, the internet came to its peak when I was already formed in my thoughts and opinions. And in terms of traditional media and its representation of minority voices, it was always incredibly sensationalist. I have done interviews where the first question is, when did you realize you weren't normal? And my response was, what's normal? I have done interviews where the content is supposed to be about advocating for change. And the first question I get is, what do you say to a guy at a bar? Because not only am I disabled, but I'm a woman. And for me, the internet gave me a platform where I had to me an agency over my own rhetoric and communication. And yes, that brings about echo chambers, and they can be problematic, but they can also be incredibly empowering too. And for me, the internet is where I could do simple things, or at least they seem simplistic, where, as regards to language and the politics of language for identity, I don't know if you know, but the word midget is a slur. It comes from an era where little people and people with dwarfism were presented in circuses and freak shows. And this is the language that was used to market them to those who weren't othered. Society has changed, and yet in many ways our language has not. As an educator in Ireland, I speak the Irish language. And for all of my life, there was no word for little person. The only word that was there was avok for dwarf. And whilst I say that I have dwarfism, I would rarely describe myself as a dwarf. So I emailed the organization responsible for the language and said, how do I get a new word put in? They said, what's your suggestion? I said, well, the direct translation for a little person is dinner biog. And they said, give us some time. And it's now in the dictionary. Now, without the power of social media giving me confidence through that echo chamber, but also being able to create a portfolio and in terms of curating trust online and with a community globally, would they have taken my opinion seriously? Would I have been able to knock on those doors? What gatekeepers would have existed? And it's brought me to all sorts in terms of, for me, so much a part of my identity is what I wear. And coming from a woman's perspective, that immediately sounds facetious because clothes are important. They are. And as a little person, as a woman, in terms of, again, those multiple identities, I was straddling the boundary of children's wear. I have a size 12 UK shoe. In terms of runners and footwear, I was offered Velcro straps, not laces. I was offered footwear that lights up, which is wonderful, but not very appropriate when you're on stage at Davos. <laughs> and then as regards to the clothes that I could wear, I look like a child physically, particularly from the back. And whilst I spend all of my life telling the world that I am an adult, that I am doing my PhD, I have a master's in broadcasting, my clothes was reminding me and the world that I was an infant and at least infantilizing me. And I've had the most incredible opportunity to work with the fashion industry on a global perspective. I'm honored and proud to say that I'm wearing Burberry today, that that brand approached me, and we have worked together in a collaborative way to create a beautiful solution, a solution which they already offer because they do alterations and adaptive fashion as part of a brand, all houses do. And yet the challenge is often that those doors have just not been knocked before. And my question would be, without the internet, would I have been allowed to? And I don't think so. And in your case, Sinead, it's definitely the constructive use of online platforms and internet. And despite the echo chamber effect or our algorithms, you were still able to get your message across. And, uh, and, and through your own efforts, you were able to open up space for these constructive uh, collaborations. Still, I, I want to focus on this uh, aspect more, and I, I want to hear from Wei Wei Nu. Is, it, is your experience in terms of, uh, your experience or your observations about how internet works in terms of bridging these divides and the echo chamber effect, is it making things difficult or is there a way out for that? What was your experience like? Um, Yes, uh, I think it's a good question. Um, online platform in these days, in this um, uh, in our generation, it's a, I, f I think it's a it's a huge opportunity for us to make impact. Uh, but the difference, uh, it, there might be some differences between country wise and 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 um, the society wise depending on where the online users are and what are the background of the online users it may be 
slightly different from users in the United States to Burma. Uh, 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 and in our experience in Burma, all the hate and the 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 the, sen the propaganda and uh, the you know the anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-Rohingya sentiment, and violence. Uh, all these uh, uh, processes, uh, the online platform has generated in a large uh, way. And it was easier at set, uh, a certain extent because, um, because of the background of the online users. For example, uh, in these days, everyone has, uh, almost all of the uh, populations in Burma can hold up a telephone, can, can get a telephone, and it's very cheap. And a SIM card, while in the past uh, 10 years, while it used to be like um, uh, like a, a, a $60, uh, a $600 now is like, uh, like $1 or $2. So it's become very cheap and everybody can use it. And given uh, uh, having the political background in the country, uh, you know, having uh, under the military dictatorship for more than five decades and having very poor uh, uh, literacy, uh, I mean, education systems and very uh, low literacy rate, everybody can just use online and get on the online and express whatever they want. And also, uh, they can just uh, uh, perceive or, or, or obtain whatever messages online uh, uh, has provided basically on Facebook. Uh, so oh, it's some, you know, like people in 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 this um, environment. I mean, in this situation, has been taking advantage of uh, online platform uh, to spread to spread hate and and prejudices. While we have, we don't have, we are not prepared, or we don't have enough uh, uh, institutions and individuals and organizations to really counter and use those online platform constructive way. So, um, and, and of course, but we started to realize the online uh, platform become a major problem, and and actually we have started a campaign called My Friend Campaign which we uh, counter hate and racism uh, by showing and honoring friendship among the diverse people, which have, of course have in our society uh, naturally, and it was there already. And everybody has, I believe, everybody's in my country or in here in this room has friends from diverse uh, uh, community. And it's not, a, it's not a problem for us to be a friend or to walk with them or to stay with them or to live with them. And we witness this, and we have, we witness this by having Having very close friend and from the diverse uh, background, but today's like the haters are are uh, basically spreading by using online platform as we cannot leave people from different color or different religion or different ethnicity, uh, and we try to prove by using the online platform, um, uh, the the social media uh, and and Facebook in effective way. And I think um, that this is like. Uh, um, I mean, the forum like this and, and people like all of you are a key position to, to really encourage this constructive dialogue on online and approaches, a positive uh, uh, approaches by using uh, online platform to change the, the narrative and to, to really bring peace in the country. And you can support in many ways. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mara, I'm going to turn to you. And do you have a comment? To, well, to make on the online factor? Indeed, I find yeah, okay. it quite fascinating, the, the online discussion, because I'm coming from an institution which traditionally has worked on physical proximity to belligerents and confidential dialogue with belligerents in order to reestablish trust uh, around conflict lines. And of course, this is a completely different ballgame than the virtualization of political debate and controversy. And I see the points that you, depending on where you look at, you can see the more positive or the more negative uh, potential of the virtual reality to which we are expanding. And I think what we see today is that we live in two worlds. We still live in the physical proximity world if we want to be effective. But at the same time, we can't be ex effective without being also part of the virtual world. Here I would like to introduce two notions which are so critical, and that's critical thinking and leadership. 
because without critical thinking, uh, which is value-based thinking at the end of the day and which allows you to make judgment on what is true and not, you will get lost in real as well as in virtual realities. You have to know where to go, otherwise you end up in another place. And I think leadership is important, and not leadership in terms of hierarchical leadership, but community leadership, and leadership has something to do with the ability to go to transcend borders, to go towards the others, because the whole idea of dialogue only works if you are not trapped in what Daniel said beforehand, into the primitive reflex of uh, when some of your identity is challenged that you close up doors and you go conflictual. So one of the critical issues, be it physical or virtual, is transcending borders, transcending identities, and, and try to understand what, where the other is coming from, and also try to understand the complexity of the world in which we are. Uh, nothing that we do can be reduced to single identity. We live from from others, we live from communities, we live from society, we live from globalization, wherever we are. So somehow we are at the present moment, and I think Dan alluded to it, and it was very interesting, that somehow the counter-reaction to globalization and connectivity is identity politics. That seems like a natural, but, but if you want to go down that drain, uh, it's really problematic, so it is important, and that's where leadership comes in. You have to be able to formulate visions for societies which go beyond single identity. Let's talk about that for a few more minutes uh, with you, Dr. Mar, and, and, and with you, Dr. Speer, and then I would like to turn to our audience, because when you say it's so important to transcend borders and identities, and at the beginning of this discussion we said we're having this conversation at a time that identity politics is on the rise, and borders have become so important and identities have become so important with the rise of right-wing populism and putting up barbed wires to protect a certain country's borders from the influx of refugees or just talking about border security. This is a very, these are very dominant themes in the global political discussion. So since we're having this conversation at such a time, I, I wanted to hear... How, how do you communicate with governments, with leaders, about how we need to transform borders and uh, trans, uh, transcend borders and transcend identities? How do decision makers react? How do politicians react well, when you say, let's not reduce everyone to a single identity but appreciate diversity? Is it hard to communicate that message? Well, I wouldn't say it's easy, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, and it's difficult because of the half-truth character of populist argument. Uh, and I think half-truth is always there is something right and therefore it's much more difficult to contradict. If somebody is completely wrong and, and says outrageous things, that's not my problem. But governments today are much more refined in propagating half-truth and have truth solutions. And I think the only recipe which is really promising and which is interesting is go to evidence-backed experience. Does building and putting the barbed wire solve your problem? Most likely not, and evidence is strong to suggest it won't. Is there something else? And that's where I think in the modest area of competence that we have as a humanitarian organization, we would try to suggest, propose, define, engage government and actors, political actors at large, into trying to find solutions which work for the problem they have and not throwing solutions which don't work to problems which 
are probably not the ones they really have. So I think this is the difficulty at the present moment of the dialogue. We have a discourse difficulty because of the half-truth factor of present-day populism, and we need to be stronger in evidence-based experience of political ways forward which work. Because I still believe that at the end of the day, as Churchill said, you can't fool everybody all the time. At a certain moment when you come with good workable solutions, you may find a way forward to break the deadlock and the vicious circle of identity policy, wrong policy recommendations, uh, which are not conducive to problem solving, but just to get it eventually re-elected. But at a certain time, voters will find out that it's all evaporated and there is nothing real happening. So I think the challenge for all of us here is how we re-establish a critical dialogue on experience-based uh, policy solutions that work for concerns which are there, which are real. We can't uh, blow them away. Dr. Shapiro, let's hear from you. Uh, just a few sentences on this, and then I would like to turn to my audience, but I want to make sure we, we close this round here. Like Dr. Amara said, um, Putting up a barbed wire doesn't solve the problem, and here is the evidence for it. Mm -hmm. But what if the politician says, well, it gets me votes? So how do we move from there? Well, well, I mean, first and of all, I yeah. think since we, we, we are focusing on the barbed wire example, uh, we are all thinking about the refugee crisis and different reactions from different European countries. Yeah. There was no single reaction. Everyone handled, handled it according to their own domestic dynamics or international vision. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to move past that uh, disagreement, well, I mean, votes, short-term gain versus vision and leadership, that? Right. I mean, to the politics. Ja, <coughs> nur der Politiker, der sagt, da kriege ich Stimmen damit, da würde ich sagen, wie steht es mit Ihren Interessen, mit deren Interessen, aus welchen Gründen tun Sie das? Und er hat das ja gesagt, oder ich habe es mindestens so gehört, dass man pragmatisch werden muss. Vielleicht noch mal zwei Gedanken, die direkt mit unserem Gespräch zu tun haben. Einmal die Identitätspolitik. Da herrscht ein gemeinsames Verständnis, wie wir Identitätspolitik in der heutigen Welt einsetzen. Und zwar wird es als Böses gesehen, etwas Schlechtes. Ich denke, es geht da in zwei Richtungen. Identitätspolitik, das heißt, die Identität wird zu einem politischen Zweck genutzt. Und dies, das kann man natürlich in böser Absicht oder guter Absicht tun. Nun, Führungspersönlichkeiten wie Nelson Mandela, der hat auch Identitätspolitik betrieben, aber es war nicht schwarz gegen weiß, sondern er sagte, wir gehören alle einer Gemeinschaft an. Und es ist Ubuntu, alle zusammen, das ist auch Identitätspolitik. Aber eben spirituell entwickelt und pragmatisch, politisch gesehen. Und dann noch ein kurzer letzter Punkt, Ganz praktisch gesehen, wenn man die Herausforderung übersimplifiziert darstellen will, dann ist, gibt es drei Fragen. Wer bin ich? Erstens einmal, wer definiert? Wie definiert man sich selbst in der Identität? Und das ist eine ganz harte Frage, mit der jeder zu kämpfen hat. Zweitens, wer ist der andere? Und wie kann ich der anderen Person in ihrer vollen Vielfalt gerecht werden? Und drittens, wie kann ich eine Beziehung mit der anderen Seite aufbauen, die funktioniert? Mein letzter Punkt, ich habe kürzlich mit einem Diplomaten in Washington D.C. gesprochen und der sagte, gut, Sie machen ja da viel menschliche Beziehungen und ich habe mit einem Taliban-Funktionär mich getroffen und der sagte, das funktioniert nicht. Also, da ist eine Geschichte dahinter. Und ich fragte nach dieser Geschichte. Wir haben eine Stunde zusammen verbracht, hieß es, und es gab nichts, was wir gefunden hätten an Gemeinsamkeit. Worüber haben Sie gesprochen? Ja, natürlich über Politik. Ja, gut. Hat dieser Mann eine Familie? Weiß ich nicht. Hat er Kinder? Weiß ich nicht. Kennt, kennt er Ihre Familie? Nein, natürlich nicht. Also, da kommen wir doch zurück zu dieser Einzelidentitätspolitik. Also, wenn wir natürlich mit diesem Stammesdenken in das Gespräch gehen und annehmen, wie der andere ist, 
obwohl eben das Problem oft nicht der andere ist, sondern unsere eigenen Instinkte, die uns in die Irre führen. Wenn wir das überwinden, wird es sehr viele Möglichkeiten geben. Ja, wir müssen jetzt zum Publikum kommen, Sinead. Wenn jemand von Ihnen eine Frage hat, bitte. Ich habe den Herrn ganz hinten als Ersten gesehen, der seine Hand hochgehalten hat und dann kommen wir nach vorne. Könnten Sie sich bitte kurz vorstellen und bitte eine Frage stellen, nicht den Kommentar abgeben. Ich bin Yves Descartes und ich führe ein Biotech-Unternehmen in der Schweiz, also ich spreche aus industrieller Sicht. Zwei kurze Fragen habe ich. Die fünf Podiumsteilnehmer scheinen sehr viel Einblick zu haben in die Fragen der Globalisierung und sogar Lösungsvorschläge haben. Meine Frage ist also, wieso ist es so schwierig, diese Lösungen umzusetzen? Zweite Frage, wenn ich weltweite Konzerne anschaue, dann scheinen sie sehr nahtlos über die Grenzen hinweg zu funktionieren. Unternehmen wie Nestle, Novartis, Apple, die sind in Myanmar genauso tätig wie in der Schweiz. Und ich denke, die können das, indem sie sich aus der Politik und Religion raushalten, einfach pragmatischer sind. Und meine Frage ist, wieso können wir nicht auch so pragmatisch werden wie die internationalen Großkonzerne und so andere Organisationen führen. Vielen Dank. Ich, wir sammeln mal die Fragen erst, würde ich meinen, und kommen dann auf die Antworten. Ja, bitte. Ich bin aus Istanbul, Türkei, meiner Unternehmens Beratungsfirma tätig. Wir haben 3,8 Millionen Flüchtlinge aus Syrien in der Türkei. Die Frage geht an Herrn Shapiro. Weder Ihr Alphabet noch Ihre Sprache ist mit uns vereinbar. Wie kommen wir damit zurecht? Denn wir wollen ja die Inklusivität natürlich fördern, aber 3,8 Millionen Menschen, das ist doch ein Riesenproblem. Ich würde mich gerne von Ihnen beraten lassen. Ja, dann bitte noch hinten in der Mitte... Ich bin Fiona von einer indonesischen Agentur für eine kreative Wirtschaft und wir werden im Mai eine Tagung zu diesem Thema veranstalten. Meine Frage geht an Sinead Burke, aber auch an die anderen Teilnehmer auf dem Podium. Sie haben viel von kreativem Denken und äh, rentablen Chancen gesprochen. Denken Sie, dass die kreative Wirtschaft die Inklusivität fördern kann? Was sind Ihre Gedanken dazu? Ja, gut, dann kommen wir doch zuerst mal zur Beantwortung dieser Fragen und nehmen noch weitere Fragen entgegen, wenn wir überhaupt dann noch Zeit dazu haben. Sinead, bitte, die letzte Frage ging ja direkt an Sie. Ja, vielen Dank für diese Frage und ich wünsche Ihnen viel Glück mit, bei dieser Tagung. Ich möchte eigentlich beide Fragen, die gestellt wurden, beantworten. Die Modeindustrie, wenn man als Beispiel nehmen, was die Herausforderung der Entwicklung und Innovation betrifft, Gerade wenn es um Minoritäten und entsprechende Mode für Behinderte geht. Also vieles hat damit dem zu tun, was Dan vorher gesagt hat. Es herrscht eine Nervosität, nicht die richtige Lösung zu haben und zugeben zu müssen, dass man gescheitert ist. Deswegen werden Scheuklappen aufgesetzt und missachtet. man missachtet einfach das Problem. Es scheint so zu funktionieren. Wieso also irgendetwas daran ändern, denken die Leute. Aber wir haben von Führungs Eigenschaften gesprochen. Jeder muss natürlich sich einzeln damit auseinandersetzen. Das ist ein kleines Beispiel. Wir haben ja vorher auch von Sprache gesprochen. Wenn Sie jemanden hören, der Midget, also Zwerg, so äh, benutzt, um jemanden Kleinwüchsigen zu bezeichnen, dann ist es Ihre Verantwortung, sich dagegen zu wehren und zu sagen, das ist nicht akzeptabel, dieses Wort zu benutzen. Also man muss schon äh, das Emotionelle herausnehmen aus dieser Frage die natürlich die Emotionen, die ein Einzelner, der betroffen ist, empfindet. Und Kreativität, was kann Kreativität für Innovation bringen? Das ist die eigentliche Lösung, ist der Schlüssel für Innovation. Ich habe ja auch von meinem Problem mit ähm, Schuhen gesprochen. Was ist die Lösung? Also ähm, 3D-Drucker, die man zu Hause haben kann, da kann ich die Patente der Schuhhersteller kaufen oder mir erwerben und äh, anpassen an meine Bedürfnisse. Und, und 
Es ist immer natürlich auch eine Frage, wer, wen stellt man an in den Großkonzernen? Und man muss sich natürlich immer fragen, an wen denken wir gerade nicht? Wer ist gerade nicht vertreten hier in diesem Gespräch? Und wie können wir diese Lücke schließen? Dadurch ergeben sich sehr viele kreative Chancen, aber es lohnt sich aus. Der weltweite Behindertenmarkt ist so groß wie China, 1,2 Milliarden Menschen. Die Kaufkraft ist 1,3 Billionen Dollar, wenn man die Familienfreunde und Familienmitglieder und Freunde mitzählt, sind es, ist es noch viel mehr. Also es soll schöne, kreative, praktische Lösungen geben, die mir Autonomie verleihen und die mich in die Lage versetzen, meine Person zum Ausdruck zu bringen und mich unabhängig durch diese Welt zu bewegen. Also wieso soll das nicht funktionieren? Worauf wartet man noch? Jeder in diesem Saal hat genug Macht, ob man CEO oder Journalist ist, spielt keine Rolle diese Bewegung in Gang zu bringen, und zwar in beschleunigter Art und Weise. Vielen Dank, Sinead. Wir kommen auf die anderen Fragen zurück, nämlich, wieso scheinen wir Lösungsvorschläge zu haben, aber, aber es ist, scheint so schwierig zu sein, sie umzusetzen, und können wir davon lernen, was, wie es internationale Konzerne machen, ganz pragmatisch, die Grenzen überwinden, also Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Maurer. Ja, sicher. Wir Menschen sind sehr gut ausgerüstet und fühlen uns natürlich auch sehr wohl, mit immer wieder dasselbe zu tun. Versuchen Sie mal, Ihren ganzes Tagesprogramm umgekehrt zu machen. Zuerst Abendessen, Mittagessen bleibt und am Schluss Frühstück. Man versuche das mal ein, zwei Wochen. Und nach drei Wochen kann man sich entscheiden, ob das jetzt normal, sich normal oder abnormal anführt. Also wir fühlen uns wohl, wenn wir die tägliche Routine haben. Und in meinem Bereich, Konfliktlösung, da heißt es dann, ihr bemüht uns euch nicht so sehr. Oder auch in der Forschung. In der Forschung. Und man macht das dann immer wieder dieselbe, auf dieselbe Art und Weise. Nun, Man fühlt sich fast gezwungen zur täglichen Routine, aber das ist genau die Herausforderung. Manchmal fühlt sich der Wandel unnatürlich an und das, was getan werden muss, will man gar nicht tun, weil es einem völlig widerstrebt. Und wenn die Strukturen da sind und einen in eine Richtung pushen, dann muss das nicht unbedingt die richtige Richtung sein. Ich denke... Es gibt die bestehende Existenz und natürlich zu dieser Frage aus der Industrie. Die Welt äh, kann sehr viel lernen äh, davon, wie die Konzerne verhandeln oder sich verhalten. Ich würde jetzt nicht sagen, dass das gleich die Utopie sein muss, wie man mit Konflikt in dieser globalisierten Welt umgehen soll. Aber natürlich hat das sehr viel mit interkulturellen Unterschieden zu tun. Wie verhalten wir uns, wenn ein Kollege in Boston sitzt, der andere in Beijing? Wie kommunizieren Sie am besten? Also da kann man aus der Wirtschaft sehr viel lernen. Dr. Maurer, bitte. Ja, da möchte ich nochmal anknüpfen an diese Frage von Yves. Natürlich ist es ein wertvoller Ansatz. Die Wirtschaft, die Unternehmen haben den großen Vorteil im Vergleich zur Politik, dass sie eine ganz Klar, ein ganz klares Ziel haben, das Erzielen von Gewinn. Und man hat eigentlich eine Strategie, um Identitäten aufzulösen und in Gewinn umzuwandeln. Man arbeitet ja nicht eigentlich, weil man einer ethnischen Minderheit angehört zu Nestle oder so, sondern weil man in einem gewinnbringenden Unternehmen tätig will. Aber das Problem ist, dass dieser Mechanismus eben in der Politik nicht funktioniert mit Gewinn auf drei Seiten. Es geht da auch um Emotionen, um Werte, um Ideen. Und hier kommen wir in ein Spannungsfeld, wenn Sie sagen, es ist eine politische Frage. Gut, dann meinen wir eigentlich implizit, dass es eine Frage ist, die man rational nicht lösen oder erklären kann. Wir haben also eigentlich einen Mehrwert der in der Politik im Vergleich zur Wirtschaft. In der Politik würde ich sagen, gut, die Grundidee, die Sie präsentiert haben, würde ich immer noch 
akzeptieren und sagen, gut, was wir als humanitäre Organisation zu tun versuchen, besteht eigentlich darin, die umstrittensten und emotionalsten Punkte in pragmatische Schritte runterzubrechen, was so ein wirtschaftsähnlicher oder strategieähnlicher Vorgang ist, dass man Identitätsfragen eben zu einem gemeinsamen Zweck in einem Unternehmen macht. Das es gibt schon interessante Dinge, wie man sagte, die man aus der Wirtschaft lernen kann. Wir müssen aber auch anerkennen, dass eben die Politiker nicht dieselben Gewinnziele quasi haben, sondern es geht darum, eine Mehrheit in der Bevölkerung zu erzielen. Und das schafft eben ein Spannungsfeld. Und dann noch ein Wort zur Türkei und zur Flüchtlingsfrage, zur vertriebenen Frage. Die Türkei, glaube ich, tut vieles sehr gut. Als Gastgeberland bei der Unterbringung von Flüchtlingen. Letztlich ist es so, dass die Türkei und viele andere Länder heute in diesem Spannungsfeld drin sind. Die Frage ist ja, wie viel kann die Gesellschaft ertragen und in welchem Rhythmus an Integration, wenn man nur die Flüchtlinge ansieht als jene mit der anderen Identität, dann haben sie vielleicht Probleme. Und wenn sie aber einen Weg aufzeigen zur Integration in eine neue Gesellschaft, sei es das erste Zielland oder, oder ein Drittland oder andere Lösungen für die Flüchtlingskrise. Ich denke, in der Türkei hat man in mancher Hinsicht in den letzten zwei Jahren gezeigt, dass es sich auch um eine ganze Entwicklung, einen Entwicklungsprozess handelt. Sie haben mehr Menschen ins Flüchtlingslager geführt und haben gesehen, das hat nicht funktioniert. Sie mussten also pragmatisch in die Wirtschaft integriert werden. Sie haben auch Möglichkeiten geschaffen, um Türkisch als Sprache zu lernen. Vielleicht ist es nicht möglich, alle Flüchtlinge zu integrieren. Sie brauchen vielleicht oder brauchen bestimmt internationale Verhandlungen, auch Unterstützung für Nachbarländer in großen Konfliktregionen, bei Situationen, in denen eben der Flüchtlingsfluss einen Punkt erreicht, der es schwierig macht für die Integration in einem Land. Aber ich denke und möchte alle daran erinnern, uns alle daran erinnern, dass der Grundpfad im Umgang mit Vertriebenen, durch Gewaltvertriebene, eben durch die Flüchtlingskonvention vorgegeben wird. Und die Welt hat da noch keine intelligenteren Lösungen gefunden als die vier, fünf Wege, die die Genfer Konvention vorschreibt. And Wei Wei Nu, you have uh, to add to. Uh, yes, I, I want to, I mean, yes, uh, I mean, I just want to reply on the uh, economic perspective. I mean, the world today is there is a lot of discussions on going on the sustainable development and growth. And I think it can only be um, achieved with the inclusive growth and with inclusions. And, and some of us may have solutions how to bring, uh, uh, how, how to build an inclusive society and, and promote inclusions uh, politically, economically, and all other social aspects. But why it is difficult to implement? I think it is because of the lack of political leadership, uh, lack of leaderships around, around the states. And uh, the states and the government does not really realize until today that how important is inclusions. Uh, and that's where they start come and they are repeating the same uh, um, uh, I mean, narrative of exclusions, discriminations, and, and inequality. And talking about, that is why I think I believe we need to do more awareness among the uh, leadership, uh, global leaderships, to, to, to really uh, promote inclusion. And, um, you know, talking about specific uh, businesses and, and investment or in, in, in Burma, uh, I think, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, in the last few years, some uh, investors, uh, business uh, companies, and NGOs are told by certain element of government not to hire a Muslim, Muslim employee. Uh, or, or there are certain uh, like kind of informal uh, uh, instructions by the uh, certain part of the elements. 
and um, I think which is uh, very, very uh, dangerous. And at the same time, as you may aware, we have uh, democratic transitions in 2011, and we have this anti-Muslim violence and uh, Rohingya, anti-Rohingya violence in Rakhine State, and which spread the whole part of the country. And, and in 2012, there were about 100 and, and, and uh, 50,000 people displaced in Rakhine State. And after, after the displacement, the government has uh, uh, launched uh, the, uh, the economic, uh, special economic zone in Chokpu and the special development zo uh, uh, zone in, uh, project in Sitwe, where about 150,000 people are put in the camps and living in apartheid-like conditions. Amnesty International has two years of research and which has released last year, October uh, and November 17, and which described the, uh, how apartheid-like conditions is ongoing in Rakhine State. And, and, and then we have been, at the same time, we have been seeing more and more uh, development, I mean, economic zones uh, uh, has been launched and, and, and business interest is there. So what I want to say is, uh, it, I, I may agree that some business uh, 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 community or companies may avoid uh, religion and politics, but uh, is that a correct way to really bring up, uh, I mean, as an ethical business, or if the business, all, all those businesses uh, are, uh, if they're in, uh, uh, complying with the business and human rights principles of UN, um, it is not, absolutely not. If without uh, looking into those kind of structural I exclusions and segregations, uh, if, 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 if businesses continue just walk into the, with, this, uh, with, the com with the comfort zone, yeah. it's mean that those businesses uh, or those companies are contributing to these, the appetite like condition which lead to the horrific, uh, you know, uh, like uh, crimes, in, in, I mean, or, uh, you know, the conflict in, in, in our region, basically. Thank you, Wei Wei. So I know we're running out of time, but since we're having this conversation in Davos, this is my last question to my panelists. We have the world map behind us, and world leaders are only steps away for the next couple of days. They're not only here to deliver speeches, but also to listen, we hope. So I want to turn to my panelists and just ask you just one sentence, one message that you would like them to listen to. Sinead, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Mara, and Wei Wei Nu, and then we'll say goodbye. I would ask them to lead with empathy. It's a quality that we undervalue as a society. But often one of the biggest challenges as regards to crisis or conflict is that we rarely understand the existence or the experience in another's shoes. And oftentimes they're so busy that we don't take a moment to take a step back and see how it affects those with less privilege or power than we do. So I'd ask them to lead with empathy. Thank you, Sinead. Dr. Shabir. Listen, in negotiation, we often talk about negotiation talks. <laughs> I think talking is the wrong part of the equation. I think we need much more listening. Listening. Empathy <laughs> and listening. Dr. Mark. I would probably appeal to courage because politicians are here again to transgress borders and to have the courage to not be stuck into single identity uh, politics. So the red thread of my message uh, to some of the leaders is uh, courage and take the long term. Courage and long term. Wei Wei Nu. Yeah, I would like to echo that. I think, uh, first of all, if we want to uh, bring peace and, and which is sustainable peace, we need to promote inclusions, which that, what does that mean is bringing people from differences, uh, gender differences, ethnic differences, religion differences, and to the, uh, to the public spaces and public uh, uh, life and, and, and include them and engage them. And this is where the leadership ha need uh, courage if we really want peace. Dr. Mar has one more thing to add. Well, completely disconnected. But uh, before we started here, uh, we discussed about a recent study which shows that when in an auditorium women are the first ones to speak, there are much more women afterwards speaking. And I saw today that three men have asked questions. 
we have. So can I encourage the Open Forum yeah. to model and this week and to let women speak first so more women will participate in the debate? Thank you, Dr. Maurer. So empathy, listening, courage, and inclusion, those are our messages from this open forum debate. Thank you so much for all your comments to our panelists, and thank you all for being thank here. You. We ran out of time. We'll leave it there. Thanks.